Hello everyone. This week uh, I'm going to break the video down into three smaller videos uh, so that you can watch them at your leisure because the first time I did this it was a little bit long. So the theme this week is uh, based upon a blog that I did a few weeks ago on our new website called The Bunkai Paradox. Um, so first of all we have a new website which is www.danielpyatt.com um, you can subscribe to the website to get updates when, when I do blogs on there, which I will be doing to support the videos that we do each week. Uh, I'm not going to do the blogs every single week, but I'm going to do them every so often to sort of fill in the gaps and any missing bits and to sort of add extra context to things that we talk about. Um, so I'm going to put a description and a link to the website in uh, the links below, so please have a look at that. Uh, and if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel already, please feel free to. We do weekly videos every Friday uh, and shall continue to do so. So the purpose of this video and the subsequent two is on looking at Bunkai. Because before I do any videos on Bunkai and sort of demonstrate any Bunkai applications and techniques, I really want to make sure that I've sort of explained my thinking, my rationale behind the way that I practice and the way that I uh, teach my students Bunkai. Um, so I'm going to break this down into three short videos. So this video is going to focus on the problems with bunkai training, um, to sort of to provide a little bit of a, a, a historical context. Um, the second one is going to focus on uh, the journey that you go through in the study of bunkai and the study and training in general. And the third one will focus on sort of my own personal truths about bunkai that I sort of hold as my assumptions when I'm sort of practicing. Um, so. This video is going to focus on the problems. Now, one of the first things about uh, Bunkai, uh, as I'm sure you all know, is that it can be quite divisive. It's one of those things that we tend to argue a lot about as Krapika. Um, one of the arguments, for example, is that people debate whether we're talking about traditional Bunkai or practical Bunkai. Now, my issue with that is the fact that, uh, to me, those two shouldn't really be mutually exclusive, and sometimes they are. You know, there's this way or there's that way. Um, now. For me, what really changes between those is your purpose and your perspective, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in the next video. But you know, you've got to ask yourself, you know, why do we have this? Why do we have this divide? And part of that is because for some people, their purpose and their perspective is that they want to train for reality, and for other people, they want to train, you know, strictly within accordance to the exactness of a kata. And both of those are fine, which we'll talk about later. But for me, the, the terms themselves are slightly unhelpful. Um, you know, for example, you know, if we talk about practical bunkai, does that mean there's impractical bunkai? You know, surely there is only practical bunkai. Surely, you know, there isn't uh, any other way of doing it. Why would anyone practice impractical bunkai? But of course, um, as much as I am an optimist in this, you know, I'm also a realist, and I accept the fact that actually there is an awful lot of quite inadequate bunkai that is regularly practiced. Uh, not by everyone, um, and obviously there are still um, some outstanding teachers that teach, you know, exceptional bunkai for their kata. Uh, but not everybody has access to those. So the, the sort of the purpose of this video is to really sort of dig into why have we ended up in this kind of situation where everybody just doesn't know bunkai and doesn't do bunkai, and it's just why is it not an easy topic in essence? So the starting point for this is the sort of the amount of change that has occurred over the last sort of 150 years in the nature of training and very much the culture of the dojo and the culture in the way that people are taught. If we go back 150 years, the dojo would have been a very small unit with only maybe two, three, four students. It wouldn't have been a dojo full of lines and lines of people. It wasn't a leisure activity. It wasn't something that you pick up and do on a, a Thursday evening because it'll fill an hour You know, when the kids are out playing football. It was a way of life, you know, and so we have this very different dynamic in the way that people train now and the way that people used to train a long time ago. Also, in that situation, when you have a teacher only teaching maybe two or three students, that teacher, their role is going to be very much to help the students explore everything they do in an awful lot deeper way, uh, which is difficult to do when the class member expands. The other thing that we have to think about is sort of the, the nature of how kata has grown and developed. Kata are obviously quite old. There are some kata that are exceptionally old. Um, but what is most likely true about kata is that kata came about in terms of the solo form following on from practical drills or practical techniques uh, that were taught by teachers. And the kata was simply a, a method of training, developing, and almost also recording those 
partner techniques that existed before. So the kata then becomes a vehicle to support the two-man aspect of it. Uh, this is something that Patrick McCarthy uh, sensei talks about uh, in some of his books, and it's something I could very much agree with as you know, the fact that kata will have developed from two-man drills initially. The only thing that I will say that sort of uh, that we have to have as, a, as a, an aside to that is the fact that um, it, it, there are some people that will say that every movement in a kata has a martial application. But there is one reason why that can't be true, uh, and that's because not all kata are designed for martial purposes. It's, it's okay to say that if you're dealing with a martial kata, but obviously there are some kata that are actually for you know health benefit. They are they are for developing and strengthening the body. You know they're breathing exercises in certain contexts, and there are examples of kata that are used in that purpose. So we do have to make sure that the kata we're talking about are indeed originally intended for martial use. That's one thing we just have to bear in mind. So I think the difference between what happened maybe 150 years ago and now is that the emphasis of chain training has changed. So when you had that small dynamic dojo, it was easy to put a lot of focus on the kumite two-man aspect of it, that, you know, doing the partner work, doing the bunkai, and exploring that. As time went on, and karate uh, went through this explosion of you know, much more people training all around the world, um, we also, as we became an awful lot more connected, we then also had a situation where you wouldn't have teachers that only taught maybe a handful of kata. So it would be normal for a dojo to maybe only have three, four, maybe five kata. You know, um, you wouldn't have a situation where you would have a dojo where you're going to learn, you know, shurite kata, then nahate kata, then tomari kata. That probably wouldn't have happened 150 years ago, although there would be certain individuals that would certain, certainly have explored more kata. So there was a lot more emphasis on a smaller number of kata, explored in an awful lot more depth, uh, rather than the sort of mass number of kata that many people practice today. Many people collect kata and just want to learn more kata, rather than sort of really digging into the detail. So that is a paradigm shift between the emphasis on the two-man form to the emphasis on the solo form, and that became far more apparent. So that obviously then propagates forward, and this leaves us in a situation then when we have a generation, not of all teachers, but of some teachers, where the emphasis is on the solo form. And so what do they propagate to their students? They propagate that emphasis on the solo form over the martial applications. So they're effectively just developed, quite naturally really, this sort of gap of knowledge um, because of the way that obviously karate exploded. So that's something we have to consider, that the role of the sensei was to teach you to explore the kata in ways that were not strictly always within the realm of the kata, which is something we'll talk about in a future video. Um, so the, the paradigm shift of the dojo has changed and the way in which the teacher is able to teach you. Um, so we now end up with this generation of, of teachers that perhaps haven't studied bunkai in the same way as the previous generation would have. Now, there are some aspects of, in that that in no way make that a bad thing, but it, it changes our relationship with bunkai, which is why now people get into this situation where there is sort of a, a, a search for what is the true bunkai, what's the true meaning. Um, and it's that search that sort of brings us to where we are now. Um, and sometimes you will also have teachers that fall into the trap of insecurity about this because they will sort of think, well, I don't know the meaning of this move. And I don't really know how to, how to unpick it. Um, and that's okay, you know, it's, you're not meant to know the answer to every, every question, but that isn't something that probably would have happened going back 150 years. You would have had a lot more meaning of the original sort of intent of the kata. The other thing is that time has simply passed, and so as the further time goes on, there are aspects of the kata that probably were thought about by their originators that simply haven't always been passed on. Kata obviously evolves, it changes. So what we've now practiced may not even represent what was originally intended by the creator. So this is something else we have to think about. So these are some of the sort of contextual problems that we have around the study of Bunkai and why we've sort of ended up in the situation uh, that we have. Now, this is not meant, to, none of these videos are meant to be exhaustive, but those are just some basic ideas for you to think about. So it'd be really great if, as part of this, if you've got any other things that you think of, you know, why do people, why have people ended up in this situation with Bunkai, why they struggle with it, please put it in the comments below uh, because it would be really useful to sort of share ideas on this point. 
So the next video I'm going to do is going to focus on uh, the journey that you go through in your study of Bunkai. Uh, and then following that, part three of this is going to be my own personal truths about Bunkai. Um, so I'll put links to, the, in, uh, to both of those videos in the description below. Um, so I hope you like it and see you next week, guys.